Our main study um, through Secret Church is heaven, hell, and the end of the world. We're going to be looking at what the Bible says about these things. We know that there's a lot of thoughts in the world about that, a lot of different ideas. But what we've said is from the very get-go, notice the screens, we need to listen with humility. This is just review. This isn't on your outline. So we need to listen with humility. I'd like for us to read Matthew 24 out loud together. So everybody's eyeballs on one of the screens. Look at Matthew 24, and let's read this out loud. It says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. That's what the Lord Jesus said. Everything else is going to disappear. Everything that seems so real to you right now is going to be gone one day. But my word is eternal. Isaiah 40, and in 1 Peter it says... The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. There's only two things that make it off the earth. There's only two things. It's the souls of people and the word of God. Everything else is going to be destroyed. Everything else is going to go away. Like you came into this world as a carbon person and your body is going to remain here as a carbon person. Eventually he will restore everything. But the present earth that we see in this day and time, the Bible makes very clear, is going to pass away. Um, so, but there's a lot of different ideas about heaven and hell and the end of the world. How many of you studied the pyramids growing up? Did you study the pyramids? I used to think the pyramids were the coolest thing in the world. So I would study the pyramids. And what was inside the pyramids? A basketball court? No, not an arena like in Memphis. Some of you have seen the, the Pyramid Memphis. No, what, what was in there? There were tombs. And what were in the tombs? All kinds of treasures. And what was the idea of all kinds of the treasures in there? They're going to take it with them. That's right, Ahelis. The idea was, you, you know, you better hope that you weren't one of Pharaoh's servants. Because I don't know if you've read about this, but there were many of Pharaoh's servants that were sent with him when he died. <laughs> so, um, you know, oh, Pharaoh's looking pretty sick, and suddenly people start dropping out of town. Um, you know, I mean, they're like, so, you know, we, we have from, from the Egyptians right on through every civilization, mankind has a lot of ideas about heaven and hell and the end of the world. Um, but what we need to do is to know what God says about heaven, hell, and the end of the world. And so we want to minimize the thoughts of who? Okay, is anybody paying attention here? We want to minimize the thoughts of man and magnify the truth of God. That's what this whole study is about. Now, we've talked about the fact that, keep on going there, Matthew, um, or, uh, sorry, Michael, and there's one of those M's. Okay, um, we, we've talked about that there's books, and then there's more books. Keep on going to the next one. There, there's, there's all kinds of books that are written about this. They're really popular and everything. But again, we don't want all of the thoughts and the, the ideas of man. We want the truth of God. And so as we look at this and as we work on this, we want to be just um, honestly coming and recognizing the realities that are around us. So last week, we looked at the frailty of life, the fact that life is fragile and that there's a finality in death. Um, we, we recognize the fact that nobody goes through death and comes back. That, that really is not what we see in the scripture. Um, there's only one who has done that, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And anybody else who did that we see in the Bible is through the power of God. Um, we see that Lazarus was raised by the voice of God. The same voice that would create the world the same voice that would speak and stars come out of his mouth was the same voice that can look at Lazarus, who's been in the tomb so long he stinks, and say, Lazarus, come forth. This and it's so amazing. The Bible fits together perfectly. Jesus does that just a few days before he goes and lays down his life for us. It's the picture of what he's about to do. He is showing Mary and Martha and his other disciples saying, I have power over life. I'm going to lay down my life and I'm going to take it up again. So he said that to them. He shows them with Lazarus. It, it, Lazarus, it, it's the very thing that happens. And um, she says, how am I supposed to believe in this? What am I supposed to think of this? And he says, Mary, I am the resurrection and the life. Um, so... The fragility of life and the finality of death. That's what we looked at. Now, look as well, and, and just kind of look at the screen. We said heaven is for real, but so is hell. 
Um, secondly, or the third idea here is, eternity is coming for us all. It's, it's not an option. The fact that, that there is the reality that death is coming. In fact, look at this next part. We said the worldwide mortality rate is what? 100%. 100%. Y'all got that. It's 100%. No one skirts that. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter how wealthy you are. Doesn't matter how good looking or beautiful or smart you are. Whether you're Einstein or whether you're Bill Gates or whether you're um, whoever, Marilyn Monroe, it's coming. So um, we've got to remember. And we said last week that death is multifaceted. It's not just one kind of death. The Bible makes this clear. And when we think about it, there's a few different ways in which death has come in. Where, what was the source of death? Where did death come from? From our sin, from the fall. We said for the wages of sin is what? Or the, the payment of sin is death. Now, what kind of death? First and, and foremost right here is spiritual death. This is separation from God. That's what we see at the fall. Um, but also through that, not only comes spiritual death, but physical death. That's the reality that the world sees very clearly and, and really we can't argue with, the reality of a physical death. But then there's letter C, this is what we call the second death or eternal death. This is when there's, you die and, and you're separated from God and then you physically die and then there is the possibility of being cut off in final separation from God. And that is very serious. That, that's perhaps one of the most serious thoughts that a human being could ever have and to consider being cut off from the living God. And so tonight, in light of that, as we come right up into this, we want to look at four conclusions on last week, four conclusions from what we studied last week about the fragility of life and the finality of death. So Page 13B, I think, is what you have in front of you, and it's just because of the way we're printing it, we, we made two 13s, but 13B is what we come to tonight, and four conclusions on this, and uh, we launch into it right now. First of all, we're going to look at the bad news first. How many of you, if somebody says, do you want the good news or the bad news, what, how many of you say, I want the good news first? How many of you say, I want the bad news first? Which one? Who would say, I want the bad news first? Put your hand up. Who would say, I want the good news first? Put your hand up. All right, so Fred, I mean, I, Mr. Chamberlain, sorry, there's three of you. Um, okay. I don't know why we want the bad news first. Um, and it's kind of like, I'm a bad news first guy too. Um, you know, the good news, sometimes you're thinking, oh, you know, okay. So the bad news is first, and, and here it is. First of all, death is our universal enemy. Fill that in. Death is our universal enemy, and we just want to see this 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 26. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. 1 Corinthians 15 is all about death and resurrection. The Apostle Paul is writing to the Corinthian church, and he's writing about this very key issue. And if you go see the whole chapter, and it's a long chapter, um, if you go see the whole chapter of 1 Corinthians 15, it's talking about death and resurrection and the reality of death. And so here we see our enemy, the last enemy that we would have, the ultimate enemy, the, the idea here is the ultimate enemy that you can have is death. Um, but what death are we talking about? Here we recognize, fill this in, we are all spiritually dead. We are all spiritually dead. Put out there aside, totally dead. Spiritually, when we come into this world, we are cut off from God. And why? Put out there to the side, the fall, Genesis 3. That we, we have to have a good understanding and a good theology as Christians of understanding the problem. And there's many, many people who don't want to think about the problem. They don't want to talk about the problem. There's preachers who will preach um, for years, and they don't want to talk about sin, and they don't want to talk about death. But to do so is ag absolutely malpractice as a preacher of the gospel. You don't have the full gospel if you're not recognizing the problem. And so when we think about this, we're all spiritually dead, and this idea of being spiritually dead is being cut off from God. Now, um, Pastor Ben 
a few years ago when he was preaching, he gave a great illustration. I remember, I'd never heard it before, and I remember, I remember it on this idea that we are all spiritually dead. You need to back up one, guys. Um, we're all spiritually dead. And here is the idea. There's many people, and even, even sometimes preachers um, and their, their theology, they would, they would say, well, it's like you're in a pool, and you really can't swim, or you're weak and you're tired, and you're trying to tread water, and you can't get out. And Jesus has come along, and he has a life ring on a rope. And Jesus comes, and he throws you the life ring in the rope, and he pulls you to safety. Now, there's the idea of a savior there. But I'll never forget, that that night, Pastor Ben just said, folks, we're not treading water struggling in the water on the surface of the pool. We're on the bottom of the pool. The Bible makes clear we're dead. We are dead in our sins. It's already happened. We're we're in trouble. We have a serious problem. And not only are we dead spiritually, but this is what leads to, we're dead spiritually first, and then this leads to our physical death. And um, so that's the second part there, guys. You can keep going. Um, We all experience physical death. But after, and and, and so just, I want you to see Ephesians 2. Here I I, I should read this. This is important. In fact, I'd like to ask somebody to just read this good and strong. Adrian, can you read this for us? Adrian, back there in the back. Read Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. Okay, but underline the top line of that where it says, and you were dead. Now, he's writing to Christians. And so that's why it's the past tense. He's saying, you were dead. But because you were in Christ, you're no longer dead spiritually. But then look at the next part. We all experience physical death. Underline the first part of 1 Corinthians 15, 22. For as in Adam, all die. You see, this is the idea of the fall, going back to Genesis chapter 3. We, he blew it. We're part of that. We are, the, the sin is passed down through all of humanity, needing a Savior. And so we are born into sin. David would say in Psalm 51, in sin I was conceived. Um, the idea is this whole world is fallen in sin. Look at the next part here. We all deserve eternal death. We have to recognize that. Why? Because God is holy and we are sinful. You you know, one of the good examples of this fact, of the fact that we are born dead and this all leads to an ultimate death is this. Do you have to teach a child to do the wrong thing? Your kids come out ready to do the wrong thing. I mean, no one has had to teach their kid to sin or to lie or to, or whatever. We have to teach them to do what is right, and, it, and it's just part of our fallen nature. That is where we gravitate. Look at the next part here. We all deserve eternal death. Look at Romans 6.23. Underline the first part of it, that first phrase. What does it say in Romans 6.23? First phrase. Read it out loud. It says what? For the wages of sin is death. This is, this is where sin leads. The consequence of our sin is death. Okay, so that is the bad news. Death is our enemy. Number one, death is our enemy. But here is the good news. And we could say the glorious news, the great news. And it's this, that death has ultimately been defeated. Death has ultimately been defeated. This is why you can have the words eternal life. This is why you can have the words everlasting life. It's because death has been defeated. And look what it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 54, and get ready to underline this. Look what it says. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, so that's when your earthly flesh, this is perishable, when we, are put, when we put on the imperishable, that is God's restoration that can never perish. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, Then shall come to pass the saying that is written. Look what it says. 
Death is swallowed up in victory. Underline that. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Underline that last part. The victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So what has overcome death but God himself, the author of life, our Lord Jesus Christ. And so there's a few things we want to recognize under this. Letter A is this. Jesus has lived the life that we could not live. This is the big deal of Jesus' life. He has lived the life that we could not live. Pilate said to him, what is truth? And after he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in it. Pilate did not find guilt in Jesus. Um, everyone around Jesus began to realize he has not sinned. In fact, one of the thieves on the cross would look and say, do you not recognize that this man is without sin? You and I are thieves. He is without sin. He has done nothing wrong. Look at Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every aspect or every respect has been tempted as we are, underline it, double underline it, yet without sin. Jesus never sinned. He was God. God does not sin. Jesus comes in the form, God comes in the form of a human, God comes in the, the body of a man, and he does not sin. He is, this is why he is the perfect sacrifice. Look what it says in 1 John 3 and verse 5. It says, you know that he appeared in order to take away sins. And then look what it says. And in him there is no sin. So we need to be very, very clear about this moral quality of God, that he is perfectly just, he is perfectly right, he is perfectly sinless. This is who Jesus was. So letter A, what is letter A at the top? Jesus has lived the life that what? Why could we not live that life? Because we're sinners. Have you ever thought to yourself, I'm going to go one whole day. I mean, I, I've thought that many times. I'm, I'm not going to blow anything once. Not one bad thought. And as soon as I say that, there's a bad thought. You know, can't control it. It's, it, it's just part of our flesh and part of who we are. That even as Christians... We still struggle with our sin. And this is part of what is the glory of the greatness of God's grace, that he saves us even as sinners. Uh, the day we get saved, we don't stop sinning. We're going to talk about that as we go on in this study. But we have a completely different perspective in a different standing with God. Okay, but so if we look at this and we say, okay, Pilate says, I find no guilt in with him. Hebrews says, yet he is without sin. 1 John 3, 5 says, there is no sin in him. But if death is the penalty of sin and Jesus had no sin, then why did he die? If Jesus was the one who had no sin and death is the penalty of sin, why did Jesus die? Well, I'm glad you asked that. I want you to see this. Letter B. Jesus has died the death we deserve to die. Fill that in. Jesus has died the death that we deserve to die. This is the amazing substitution that he would go in our place. He does not deserve to die, but he goes in our place. We call this the substitutionary death of Christ or the substitutionary atonement of our sins. Look at Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 17. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the servants of God. And look what it says, to make propitiation, that is, that is the satisfaction or to make the complete healing for the sins of the people. Look at Romans 5, 6 through 8. And I'm going to ask Pastor Lucas to read Romans 5, 6 through 8 while I get a drink. Go ahead. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the unknown. For one who scarcely died for a righteous person. Though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even die. But God shows his 
Oh man, there's so much. We can underline the whole thing, but especially underline that last phrase at the end. And I want you to see it as you underline it. But God, but God shows his love for us in that while we're still sinners, underline it, double part there, Christ died for us. This is the glorious gospel. Look at Galatians 3.13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. That comes from Deuteronomy. The whole picture of this, whoever's hanged up on a tree, like brought up and punished on a tree, that person is a curse. And what, so what did Christ do? From the Old Testament, we see this curse that is the picture of the coming Messiah that Jesus would say, you say that's cursed, I'm going to be cursed for you so that I am coming to save you from your sins. So, so much love, so much beauty in this. Look at 1 Peter 2, 24. He himself, not somebody else, but he himself bore our sins, underline it, in his body on the tree. This was the physical sacrifice the spiritual sacrifice of God. He himself bore his body, bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Do you see how it's being turned there? That the sin that would take you to death because of Jesus, it is the fact that we die to sin. We, we will come to a place where sin no longer reigns over us. In Christ. So look at this that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. And right out there to the side, Isaiah 53. Because in Isaiah 53, it is the beautiful picture of the suffering servant. And it says, by his stripes that we are here, that means by his whipping, by his torture, and by his wounds, he was pierced through for our iniquities, it says in Isaiah 53. Look at 2 Corinthians 5.21, possibly one of my favorite verses out of 2 Corinthians. Look what it says. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. I want you to get that because it's weird. Look what it says. For he, right above he, God the Father. For he made him, right above the word him, God the Son. Are you all getting that? Always remember this from now on in 2 Corinthians 5.21. I usually point this out, but I want you to get it. For he, God the Father, made him, God the Son, to be sin who knew no sin. He didn't know any sin, and yet it's what we just read at the top of the page. And then underline that word, so that, or those two words, so that. Here's the reason he did that. In him, we might become the righteousness of God. See, so many times people have said, well, yeah, I come to your church, and I hear you all talk about Jesus dying on the cross, and I, I've never understood, why does Jesus die on the cross? Why is he? Oh, dear friend, let your heart take this, this truth into your heart right now. The reason that Jesus died was to pay for your sin and to my sin. And then he rose again to show that he has power over sin, that he conquers it, and he leaves sin in the grave and brings life and righteousness out of the grave. This is the picture. So letter C is this. Fill this in. Jesus has conquered the enemy we cannot conquer. Jesus has conquered the enemy we cannot conquer. What is the enemy? What did we say? Right above there, death. And we could say sin and death. Jesus has conquered sin and he's conquered death. And it was the one we couldn't conquer. We we were completely in, in all of this points to the fact that we need to be saved. We need a savior. So when people say in, in good old cultural Christianity say, well, you know, I got saved. And when I got saved, we use that term, I got saved, this person got saved or whatever. That's literally what we're talking about. It's not a bad term. I was saved from my sin. I was headed to being cut off from God. 
but he has rescued me, he has saved me. That's not just religious jargon, that's really theological, theologically sound um, speaking, that he has rescued us, he has conquered the enemy. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, um, 3 through 8. Uh, Becky, can I put you on the spot? Would you mind reading that good and loud? Just stand where you are so everybody can hear you on the other side if you don't mind. Everybody follow along as Becky reads 5, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8. And who's writing this except the Apostle Paul? And he came late to the party. Um, it, yeah, it was, Jesus had already done his thing on earth and ascended to the Father. And Paul on the Damascus Road experience would have this conversion experience. Um, and it, that's, where I, that's why he's saying eventually he appeared to me in that picture. But don't miss the top part where it says, the most important thing that I've delivered to you, the most important thing that Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul was preaching to them was that is that Christ died for our sins. And it says there, according to the scriptures. What does that mean? Right above the word scriptures there, OT. And what does OT stand for? The Old Testament. That is, that is the promise that a Messiah would come. That's what the, the Jewish people were waiting on. In fact, even today, if there's someone who reads the Old Testament scripture, perhaps in Judaism, and they're looking at that, and they keep saying, well, we're waiting on the Messiah, waiting on the Messiah, waiting on the Messiah. Our big hope is that they would discover, oh, the Messiah has already come. He was promised, but he came. He was buried. He was dead. He was stone cold dead. And then he was raised on the third day. Again, according to the scriptures, that was Old Testament prophecy that he would be raised from the dead. And so Jesus has conquered this enemy that we cannot conquer. Look at Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Since therefore, oh yeah, that's right. You got to turn your page. Give you a second. Look at the top of the page. Hebrews 2, 14, 15. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who, is, who has the power of death. Now here's the idea. Jesus took on flesh and blood. That's what he's saying here. He partook. He, he took on this. He became flesh and blood. That's why Christmas is such a big deal. The incarnation, that he would come take on flesh and blood that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. We don't have to be afraid anymore of death because of Jesus' death and resurrection for us. Um, 2 Corinthians 2.13, just the top of it says, look what it says, and you were dead in your trespasses in the uncircumcision of your flesh. Just right above the word dead, at the bottom of the pool. You were dead. You weren't, you, weren't, you weren't dying, you were dead. He says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins and uncircumcision. God made alive together with him, having forgiven us of all our trespasses. By canceling the record of debt that is against us, that it stood with its legal demands, that he might set us, that he might, excuse me, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. Talk, not talking about Roman rulers and authorities, talking about the rulers of the authorities of the power of the air over our sin in this fallen world, that Jesus conquers them. And this is also exactly, you see that where it says there up there in that verse, canceling the record of debt that stood against us. That's why Jesus would say, it is finished on the cross. The, the Bible fits together like lock and key. I hope you're seeing that. The reason that Jesus, some of Jesus' last words would be, it is finished as he dies and gives up his gift. The word it is finished is literally a legal term and it means paid in full. So Jesus goes to death, paying in full, the perfect sacrifice, the one who never sinned, that should have never died, 
goes to death saying, this is how much I love you. That I should never have been put to death, but I willingly laid down my life as God of the universe in order to save you, to show you how much I love you. So, huge circle. I want you to put a huge circle around both the, deci- the decisive issue and Romans 10, 9, and 10. That whole thing. Just circle that whole thing because this is a big deal. If you go back through your notes later, I want you to see that this is the crux of the matter. This is such a big issue. Look what it says in Romans 10, 9, and 10. It says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord... And believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. Underline this. You will be saved. It doesn't say you might be saved. It says you will be saved. And look what he goes on to say. For with the heart one believes and is justified. And with the the mouth one confesses and is saved. You see, our, our salvation experience is both inward with the heart but it's also outward, it's with the mouth. And so what's the big, huge word in this sentence? The one right at the beginning of the sentence. If. Jesus is calling us to believe upon him. He's calling us to confess him with our mouth, with our life. And I I just want to remind you that this is in a time when people, when they would say, yes, I am a follower of Christ, I believe... Either the Jews could come after them and stone them to death, or the Romans could come after them and call them an atheist because they don't believe in the Roman gods and troublemakers and everything else. This was a huge thing that they are confessing Jesus with their mouth and believing in their heart that God is, from, God is raising from the dead. You see, this is both an inward conversion and an outward conversion that we are expressing that. So I just want you to kind of think about this whole thing. We've talked about the reality of death, the fragility of life, the finality of death. There's no there's coming back. And we talked about the huge bad news that death is an enemy and death comes to us through sin. But we've talked about the really good news that the ultimate enemy of death has been conquered through Jesus Christ. All of you have heard that today. You've heard that maybe a thousand times in your life, maybe 10,000 times in your life, or maybe a hundred times, whatever. But the huge question now is this. Will you turn away from Jesus? You've heard this. You've heard that the Savior has died for you. Will you turn away from him saying, I love you this much? My friends, listen. Listen. When God is calling us to himself and he's saying, just come to me and believe. He calls us to run to him in belief. To run to him in confession. To run to him in repentance. My precious daughter is here today, tonight. And um, she probably knows which story I'm about to tell. And I've shared this one time before. But it's a concept that is very real. And I saw it alive in my child. You know, your children teach you a lot. Children teach you a lot about life. They teach you a lot about yourself. They teach you a lot about God. Well, we lived in St. Augustine. There was a fence in the backyard, and we would tell the girls, don't climb on the fence. We'd say, don't climb on the fence. Don't climb on the fence. You're not allowed to climb. There were woods behind the fence. They weren't allowed to climb on the fence, chain link fence. And um, I said, if you try to climb on the fence, you're going to get a spanking. You're not allowed to climb on the fence. It's dangerous, especially when Mama and Daddy aren't out here. So we're inside the house. And I look out the window, and there's Cheryl Ann up on the fence. And she's up there having a gay old time, looking around, you know, into the trees and everything else. She doesn't realize that the house is dark inside, and it's bright outside. She can't see us, but we can see her. And so I just sit there and watch her for a few minutes. And then I walk out on the back porch, and I ease out of the screen porch just into her view. And I'm just looking at her. She jumps down off the fence, and she runs to me in tears. She ran to me in tears. And she wasn't running to me in anything but repentance and in, in confession. That's what she was doing. She knew that I knew. 
And she wasn't making excuses. She didn't jump down on the ground and say, I wasn't on the fence. Now, she may have done that at other times. But in that moment, she ran to me in repentance. My friends, that's what you can do. You can run to God in repentance. If you laid down your life for me, why would I not run to you? I just want you to see tonight that this is the question. If you will confess Jesus with, as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Will you turn away from him? Look at the next part. You see, here's the big picture. Letter A is this. You can live without Christ now. And letter B is, you can die without Christ forever. A, you can live without Christ now, and you can die without Christ forever. If you are intent on not having Christ, you can have both. You can live without Him now, and you can die without Him forever. Look at Romans 6.16 under letter A. Look what it says. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. Look at the next part. You can die without Christ forever. 2 Thessalonians 1, 9 through 10. So very critical. Everybody look at this. Look what it says. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among, among all who have believed because of our testimony to you was believed. Here's, here's the picture. It's either you can live without Christ now and die without him forever, or notice this with me, letter C. For the non-Christian, death remains an eternally dreaded enemy. See, we said death has been overcome. It has been conquered, but it's only been conquered through Christ. But for the non-Christian who continues to say, I don't want Jesus. This is, this is, not, this is not me. I, I, I don't want this. Oh, dear friend, look at, look at the consequence of this. The enemy of death remains real to us. Notice the bottom of page 15 what it says. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were open. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name, here it is, the key thing, underline this. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. And why? Because they had rejected the Savior. So number three, will you say no to Christ and reject him or, and turn away from him? Or number four, will you trust in him? This is so beautiful. Galatians 2.20 says, and let's read Galatians 2.20 out loud together if you would. Look what it says in Galatians 2.20. And this is talking about trusting in Christ and coming, to, coming into life in him. Look what it says. Let's read it. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Oh, the glorious picture of the rescue. It's no longer I'm me who's trying to do it. It's him. You know, there's a lot of people who say, well, I just, I'm sorry, Pastor, but I can't become a Christian. Just, I, I can't live like all you people live. I can't do that. And I say, well, neither can I. It's not me. Cultural Christianity tries to play a religious game. Cultural Christianity tries to look good. But true biblical Christianity says, I'm a worm. 
I'm a sinner. I have no value in myself. The only value I have is the value that Christ has come and rescued me. And so if Andrew Coleman is trying to live as a Christian and even as a pastor, I can tell you that the only hope that I have is that Jesus has forgiven me of my sins and he's given me his spirit and he is, he is living out his glory in my life. And the more I let go of me and the things of this world and the more I hold on to him, the more he gives me the power to obey. I mean, I have been given that through his grace and you have too. So Christians aren't better than anybody else. They're just forgiven. And there's a big difference. Christians are not better than anybody else. I am no better than the most vile guy that's down in the Broward County Jail. I'm simply forgiven. And that is the gospel. And the, and the only reason I'm forgiven is not because of anything I've done but because of everything Christ has done. And so we, we just need to see the glory of this. So the question is, will you turn away from Jesus or will you trust in Jesus? And Galatians 2.20 says that we, we just simply come and live by faith. Look at that, underline that, live by faith in the Son of God. You just trust him to do what he said he'd do. He said he'd forgive you, so you trust him to forgive you. Say, Lord, if you said you'd forgive me, I trust you to forgive me. I turn from myself and I turn to you. Forgive me. So letter A is this, that we die with Christ now in this life. Yes, we die with Christ. You die, just like Jesus died on the cross. You die now by, by a decision of following Jesus. You say, I'm going to die to me and to my old life, and I'm going to live to Christ. Now, Romans 6, 5 through 11, is so rich with this idea of dying with Christ now. And this is so important. Romans 6 is important. And I'm going to ask Edward to lift up his voice and read Romans 6, 5 through 11. Everybody follow along carefully. This is die with Christ now. Isn't that beautiful? He's called us to just, just consider yourself dead. You say, well, sometimes I don't feel dead to sin. Somebody, sometimes I really want to sin. I really want to be angry. Or I really want to be lustful. Or I really want to be vindictive. Or I really want to be angry. Or I really want to be whatever. I understand, but that's your flesh crying out. And if you've come to Christ, what, we, what, we, what this passage is calling us to recognize is that stuff doesn't belong there anymore. That's not what you're supposed to do. You, you, you're you're to, to set your sights on the things that are above because your life is now hidden with Christ in God. It just doesn't make sense for Christians to act like this. And this is why sometimes when we're talking together and sometimes as pastors or just as brothers and sisters in Christ in the life of the church, sometimes somebody will do something and we sit down and we talk and we're sitting there and we're going, why'd you do that? Why are you doing that? This doesn't make sense. You say that you're a Christian. You say that Christ has forgiven you of your sins. Then why are you loving these things and holding, or why, do you, why are you continuing to do that? It's an honest question, and that's what he's saying. He's saying, look at the, the bottom line of that, of that passage in Romans 6, 5. He says, so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. And so this beautiful picture, die to, you die to yourself now, die to sin now, and die with Christ as he has done, and then let her be, live with Christ forever. This is the glorious picture, and that life doesn't start after you die. That life starts the day you get saved, that you live with Christ forever. Look at John eleven twenty five. 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. 
I don't think I've ever preached a funeral without quoting that passage right there. Because that is the hope of every funeral that, that you could ever have to, to preach to people is that if you come to Christ, though you die, you can live. I mean, that is the big picture, that Christ has overcome this physical death to give us a spiritual life that is eternal. So what's really interesting here is that for the Christian, death becomes... Notice the screen. For the Christian, death becomes a surprisingly helpful friend. Why would we say that? How can death become a surprisingly helpful friend? What does that mean? Say it again. Eternal life with Christ. Yeah. And what's the portal through which we get to eternal life in Christ, we walk through death. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to be meet Joe Black here, that, you know, you know, Brad Pitt shows up and he's representing the death angel and everything. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that movie, but it's, it's really an intriguing movie. Um, but the, the picture is, is that death no longer has to be fearful. You know, if you're without Christ and you haven't been promised by the creator of the universe that though you die, yet shall you live, you ought to fear death. But, you know, if you see what the promises are here and how he has made promises after promises after promises and kept them and kept them and kept them and kept them, like, I'm going to send my... Messiah to you, I'm going to send him, and it's going to look like this, it's going to go down like this, this is all going to happen, all of these prophecies, and then Jesus comes, and then he fulfills those prophecies beautifully, to the T. And then he makes more promises, and those promises keep coming to be. Listen, you can run to death with the joy and the hope of true life. Um... Maybe some of you would say, Pastor, I really deal with being super afraid of death. And I would say, okay, we all deal with different things. And I want to say, you need to apply, if you're a Christian, you need to apply the beauty of the gospel to your fear of death. And begin to realize that death is simply through which the door you walk into the presence of God for eternity. Um, now, a lot of people have said, you know, I'm not afraid to die. I'm really not afraid to die. I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> you know? <laughs> right? We, we, we don't, we don't, we're not, look, we don't have a death wish. We just don't want to necessarily be there when it happens. I am so inspired, and I'm going to share a little bit of a story here by video in just a second. But first of all, let's look at this. Um, look at Luke 23, 39 through 43. Remember, Jesus is there in the center cross. And you can read the Gospels and read this. And there's a thief on one side, or there's a criminal on one side, and there's a criminal on another side. And one of the criminals is cursing him, and the other criminal is confessing him as Lord. I want you to read this. Look what it says. One of the criminals who was hanged railed against him, saying, Are you not the Christ, that's Messiah, the one that's going to pay for our sins? Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. Think about it. They're dying on the crosses, nailed to crosses in agony. They know they're going to die. But the other rebuked him. So the other criminal rebuked him saying, Do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, that means we, we, we should be under this condemnation. We indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember we, me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, what did that criminal do in order to be promised 
today you will be with me in paradise. He believed in his heart and he confessed with his mouth. Did he go wash the old lady's car across the street in Jerusalem? No. Did he, you know, go fix this or go fix it? Did he go into temple a number of times? Did he go to church? Did he tithe? Did he, did he do anything? Was he, was he even baptized? No. The Presbyterians say, well, God may have rained on him. It was stormy <laughs> that day. You know. No. There's no, he didn't do anything. He didn't do anything. He just believed and he confessed. And Jesus said, today, you're going to be with me in paradise. This is the gospel. Look at Acts 7, 56. Man, this is so good. And he said, behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. You see, here's Stephen being stoned to death. Stephen looks up, death's a friend. I see the Son of Man. Look at Philippians 1, 20 through 23. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ. This is, this is Paul who's waiting to be put to death. Okay? He's on death row. That, but that with the full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Underline it. For me to live is Christ, and to die is what? Gain. Do you see that for the Christian... Death, the sting of death is gone. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. For am I, for if I am to live in the flesh, that means, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ. For that is far better. Friends, the greatest life that you could possibly live. Okay, you're a billionaire. You have more money than you can ever spend. You think of whatever the greatest thing this world has to offer. Listen, for the true Christian, there is nothing in this life as great as it could ever be. You're not the 300-foot yacht that Andreas is rebuilding over here across town. You know, for me, that would be like heaven. I'm a boat guy. I like boats. And be able to go anywhere in the world in a fancy boat and do all of those things and have a submarine on board and everything. I mean, these guys, it's, you know, gold toilet seats and everything else. I mean, the, 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 you know, whatever the world, the greatest thing the world has to offer is absolutely nothing compared to the glory that we're going to have when we see God and be with him in his presence. It makes the finest yacht that Andreas could ever work on look like a garbage can. Seriously. The beauty, it's so much far better to be with Christ. So here's the definitive conclusion on the whole thing. Death is not the end. Death is not the end. In Hebrews 9, 27 it says, and it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. So death is not the end. There's something that's coming after this physical death. But death is only the beginning. And it's the beginning of one of two things. It's either the beginning of eternity with God or it's the beginning of eternity without God, without the buffer of this earthly life. Now, you see a phrase here, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Um, oh God, this is the end for me, the beginning. I, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was um, a man in World War II um, under Nazi Germany. Some of you have heard the story of his life. He was a pastor, professor, theologian, philosopher, rebel against the Third Reich. He actually participated in um, a couple of plots to assassinate Hitler because Hitler was so diabolical and he knew that even as a pastor. And at the end of his life, notice what he said, 
Oh God, this is the end. <laughs> For me, the beginning of life. The end of a world of fallen sinfulness and the beginning of life. He knew what the scripture would say. He said, no, this is not the end. This is the beginning. Um, do you have that hope? Let's pray together tonight as we finish.